something historic happened in Monday. On Monday. On Monday this week. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was at State House Nairobi. We witnessed the signing of a new economic partnership agreement between Kenya and the European Union. Mm -hmm. The president of the EU was in the country. Did you know that? Yes. What's her name? I never get to pronounce that name. Uh, Ursula Van der Van? Van de... Wait. Just Ursula is good. Yeah, Ursula is good. For now. I'll okay. tell you in a minute. President Ursula was in the country. Okay? And we, Kenya signed an economic partnership agreement with the EU. Uh, the person who was, you know, behind pulling the, all the strings and making sure that this EU pact is concrete is the principal secretary in the State Department for Trade, Alfred Ombudo Kabudo. He's our guest. Good morning, Alfred. Good morning, uh, Eric, and good morning, everyone else, and good morning, Kenya. Welcome to the hot seat of the Situation Room. Thank you very much. You look well relaxed for now yeah oh, yes this is a, a, at least you got it's that a good, it's a good way to start you got that across you know off over the line yes next you're picking up something else yes. we still have the american one also to talk about that's right Where? it's a big one yes welcome the city has the day's proverb this week his proverbs are from one country in africa mm -hmm. every week he has a proverb from uh proverbs from one country in africa which country this week, City? We are in the East African country of Kenya. Yeah. Hey. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> Not the Kingdom of Kenya. Not the Kingdom of Kenya. But the Republic. Not the Protectorate of Kenya. Eh. The country of Kenya. Right. Republic of Kenya. Mm. Right. Yes, we the proverbs we've had until yesterday were all in the English language. Mm. And we felt surely we are in Kenya talking about Kenyan proverbs. Why not have one in the Kiswahili language? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here it is. Makali ya jicho ya shinda wembe. Makali ya jicho ya shinda wembe. Yes. Bona P.S. Yes. What's your interpretation of this proverb? Okay. Uh, makali ya jicho ya shinda ya? Ya shinda wembe. Ya shinda wembe. Yes. Well, I think uh, uh, when I reflect on it, it probably means that uh, that which we think, that which we manifest, that which we um, uh, originate in our mind can be very good or very devastating, more than even a razor blade. And therefore, I think it calls upon all of us to say, look, um, let's, let's mind what we think. Let's have ideas, but let's also know that ideas cut both ways. Because like a wembe, a wembe has two sides, doesn't it? Mm. So I think that's really what comes to my mind. Um, and there are many sayings, I think, that sort of follow that uh, trajectory. Mm. I heard of one, I can't remember where it was from, that says that um, um, the, a strategy or a, an idea uh, can build communities or send people to the grave you know mm. uh, more than any army can mm. so i think that's really just uh, an expression that uh, reminds us just how powerful our minds are and how it's important for everything we do including the economic partnership agreement which we have negotiated and which we look forward to bringing prosperity to this nation very good very good perspective very good perspective in that proverb now getting straight into the epa so give us a background of this economic <coughs> partnership agreement so um first and foremost i think it's important to um give the uh, economic partnership agreement its correct name mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the long title of the agreement it says it's an agreement uh, between Kenya, mm -hmm. a member of the East African community mm -hmm. on the one part, and the European Union. What does this mean? It means that at its core, this is a agreement which has been uh, largely negotiated based on our common um, uh, principles as the East African community, mm -hmm. uh, which um, was negotiated as East Africa community um, and finalized more or less in 2014. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, we have had uh, um, a need to ensure that this was finalized. Uh, some of our brothers and sisters who are a bit uh, slower to do this, mm. and Kenya uh, took the leadership in finalizing this agreement, but which leaves it open for the other EAC countries also to accede when they're ready. 
Okay. So the negotiations started as the East Africa community. Correct. And then at some point, mm -hmm. the other countries in the East African community were not moving as fast as they had been moving. Mm -hmm. And Kenya felt the need to continue running. Yes. Or to inject a kick in the final two laps. Correct. Of the 10,000 meter race. Correct. Why did Kenya decide to leave the others behind? Kenya did not leave the others behind. Kenya is no longer an LDC, or at least developed country. Mm. And because of that, um, there are certain imperatives around what developed countries, for example, allow LDCs to be able to import into their countries on duty-free terms, on very generous terms. But as a country grows, and as you move towards middle income, then the expectation is that you stop relying too much on the freebies and you start uh, having less room to um, have negotiate uh, have agreements that are based on you just being an LDC mm. and therefore Kenya had the necessity to make sure that it had uh, an agreement that ensures that its goods are still able to access large markets like uh, the European Union uh, on duty-free and quarter-free basis. That's really the crux of why Kenya had to move ahead. If you recall around 2018 or 2017 or thereabouts, mm. uh, when Brexit happened, um, there was a period there where because we didn't have an agreement with the U uh, UK, mm. our flowers could not be uh, exported duty-free. Mm. And this sort of had to be fixed fairly quickly mm -hmm. um luckily the european union uh even after we became a middle uh, uh we exited ldc status mm -hmm. provided a temporary market a regulation that allowed us to continue um exporting our goods on duty-free terms it was a narrower set of goods and it was a temporary instrument that could be withdrawn at any time mm -hmm. and this kind of uncertainty was not good for investment it was not good for industry and therefore the necessity was for us to ensure that we have a permanent agreement that allows us duty-free, quarter-free access into the European Union. Do the other countries in the East African community currently enjoy that duty-free access to the EU? They enjoy a restricted uh, access, mm. uh, not encompassing uh, all the goods, uh, but um, they, uh, they exercise this because they are LDCs and therefore um, they are able to export on such terms. Mm. But this is a one-sided uh, instrument that can be withdrawn at any time um, and it does not also signal uh, that one now has arrived to um, 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 a status which is one that is encouraging investment, encouraging industry and all mm. these things. Yeah. On the other side, yes. does the EU have free access into these markets within the EAC? Uh, no. So that's one of the features of uh, the economic partnership agreement that we negotiated and signed, is that um, it is a very um, generous, I would say, um, agreement uh, to the uh, developmental side um we have gotten um 100 percent duty free quarter free access quarter free access means that not only does your goods get there without duties mm. but you can take as many as you want okay. no limits as mm. to that but on the side of the eu uh we have uh, been less generous if mm. i can put it that way uh, the first thing is that there are a number of uh, goods which are permanently excluded from um, uh, duty-free access mm. into Kenya. And those are goods which we considered were of a sensitive nature, mm. mainly relating to agriculture, mainly relating to industries whereby we think we can start developing over the next 10, 15 or 25 years. And so those ones are permanently excluded from this agreement. Mm. These are things uh, like in the sugar industry, uh, wheat, uh, teas, fruits, butter, uh, fish, dairy stuff, those kind of sectors, which are also closely connected to some of the sectors we are growing, like the dairy sector, agro-processing, and so on and so forth. So in this uh, set of goods, 
those are permanently excluded. Then there are others which um, we believe that in about 25 years mm. with investment and industry developing, we should be more or less fine. And so these are those areas whereby over the next 25 years, we shall be abolishing the tariffs in respect to the European Union. And then there are also a set which will be abolished in 15 years, which are also mostly connected to sectors that um, are far more um, complex mm. and that maybe we still need to import a lot there. And those which are eliminated immediately are actually for our benefit. Mm. And these are things like um, machinery for infrastructure, uh, railway truck fixtures, um, firefighting vehicles, concrete mixers, places whereby we need equipment in order to progress in things like construction, in agricultural development, and so on and so forth. Mm. Don't forget that in any case, a lot of what the Europeans import into Kenya is uh, mostly machinery, and many of this is also agricultural machinery. Many of these are already zero rated mm. for duties. Mm. Can we look at the agreement? Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times, and of course, then it goes into, unfortunately, sometimes political conversations yes. about really how much negotiating muscle mm -hmm. Kenya then did have on the table. Yes. Are we looking at 50-50 mm -hmm. um, QPP where everybody was saying, look, this is what we bring, this is what we take. Mm -hmm. And on the other side as well, the European Union saying, okay, absolutely, Kenya is a sovereign state. This is what you, this is what we would ask for, this is what you take mm -hmm. was it equal in terms of its negotiation a negotiation is a negotiation and uh, everybody puts their best foot forward um, given that we started this off as uh, East African community mm. uh, it was probably the European Union that had a disadvantage okay because uh, we had uh, five or so partner states on the table mm -hmm. and the EU on the other side and therefore, we were able to have those conversations in a way whereby um, we were not only looking at Kenya's interests, but Burundi's interests, Tanzania's interests, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, trade negotiations are a fairly complex area. Mm -hmm. It involves a lot of knowledge of law, mm -hmm. um, a lot of uh, knowledge on agriculture, on industry, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I do believe that Kenya has matured to the extent whereby we have some of the best professionals available that can negotiate an agreement practically with any country in this world. Mm -hmm. you know, the, as I heard you speak, Bonapiers, something came to mind. Mm -hmm. So, are we saying that... Um, the agreements we've signed with the EU, well, we signed one with the UK as well at some time, mm -hmm. we signed another one with the US. Mm -hmm. Are we seeing that these are not in abrogation with any understandings we had for the Africa Free Trade Agreements, the sovereign community, that in no way do they infringe on these other agreements? No, they do not infringe on these agreements. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the example of uh, the EU agreement itself. Uh, where we have expressly as East African community agreed that we want to get into this relationship with the EU. Mm -hmm. We negotiated together. 99% of the agreement uh, remains as it is. And therefore, um, it reflects that uh, community spirit. In 2021, when Kenya said, look, if we continue in a situation whereby we don't have an agreement and we are not an LDC, we'll be in a lot of trouble for our exports. And so the heads of states of uh, the East African community at a summit in 2021, I believe in November, mm -hmm. said those who are ready can proceed and those who are not yet ready can proceed when they are ready. Uh, there are countries within the EAC that are going to leave LDC status soon. Mm. Tanzania is one of them. Mm. Uh, I do expect that in very short order, you will see many more coming up to accede to this agreement. You mentioned African continental free trade area and other agreements. There's a principle in the World Trade Organization that allows countries to basically get into trade agreements uh, provided that um, they conform to WTO principles. Mm. And so you can get into an agreement with the EU, you can continue doing AFCTA, you can continue expanding your markets, provided you do not um, uh, derogate WTO rules. You know, I find, I find it curious <coughs> when you also mention that 
the original agreement we had was disadvantageous to the EU? Not entirely, but it was a generous uh, agreement. Uh, generous, because I mean, I, I, I was going to smile all the way to next week, yes. contemplating mm. it, saying that, you know, this is a first. We got them. No, it's a first, because mm. the countries negotiate for things that benefit them. That's true. And a uh, trading bloc like the EU would be no exception to the rule. Mm. Let's talk about the advantages. What are these advantages that we're going to have? The advantages are plenty. I think the immediate advantage that we get, probably the most significant one, is certainty mm -hmm. of market. Mm -hmm. What does certainty of market mean? It means that once you know that you're able to export on permanent terms, because economic partnership agreements are permanent instruments. No, exp just explain permanent before we continue so that we understand. Uh, permanent is... Uh, until the last sunrise of the world, basically. Um, so this is not... Into perpetuity. Into perpetuity. Okay. So that's basically it. But, of course, it has provisions where you can modify, you can even exit and so forth. Mm. So it's permanent until it's not permanent. Mm. So um, what this uh, basically means is that we are now able to signal to the world that we have access to a $18 trillion economy 27 countries, a single set of regulations. That's a big um, uh, impact on our investment um, signaling to the world. <coughs> Sorry. Now, once we are able to do that, then um, we are also then able to have a better basis to advance industry. Because if you are telling people that you have access to a market that's $18 trillion, 27 countries, a single set of regulations with no tariffs, then people from all over the world that want to get into the European Union are going to come to Kenya. I'll give you an example. Currently, we are exporting very little textile and apparel into the European Union. We're exporting most of it to the United States, mm -hmm. probably about $500 million dollars. There are countries like Bangladesh that have been exporting about $40 billion what? worth of textile and apparel into the European Union. Mm. <clears throat> Bangladesh is a least developing country, <laughs> but in 2026, it's going to graduate from LDC status. Mm. Mm. What does that mean? It means that and sometimes in a sector such as the textile and apparel, the margin you make is actually the tariff exclusion. Mm. So if you're going to get excluded 30%, maybe that's your margin. Yeah. Now, if we have this kind of access, then we are an immediate magnet for factories, maybe in places like that, that want to continue exporting using the same relationships that they've built in the EU. And we can have conversations with them to locate in Kenya, create... 100, 200, 300,000 jobs and continue exporting into the EU. And that's just one example. Mm. There are tens and tens and tens of sectors whereby we can actually do manufacturing with the eye of taking things to the EU. The reverse is also extremely important. Mm. <coughs> there are European, American, Japanese um, uh, companies that want to export into EAC and Africa continental free trade area. Mm. Because of this relationship, if they can, they are now able to increasingly look at Kenya as a place where they can do manufacturing in order to get into the rest of the East African community. Mm. There are many more um, benefits. Mm. Uh, it would take the entire studio time mm. uh, if I were to, uh, to preach on the benefits. Preach, but let me preach on at least maybe two or three more. Mm. <clears throat> Um, Kenya is a champion now on issues of climate change. Kenya is championing a more sustainable uh, world whereby climate finance is done more equitably and so on and so forth. That has been a very clear uh, clarion call by His Excellency the President. <clears throat> One of the ways in which Kenya can benefit from the climate conversation is trade. European consumers are very more careful about knowing where goods they're consuming are coming from, how they're produced, and so on and so forth.
Kenya has a chance not just to export to the EU, but to export sustainably produced goods where the energy is clean and the processes have been done properly. Mm. And those products attract a 15, 20, 25 percent, 30 percent premium in the market. Mm -hmm. It means that we can actually profit from the environmental agenda which we share in common with the European Union. And finally, um, we also commit to raise our standards in as far as <clears throat> how we manage customs procedures, how mm -hmm. we manage trade logistics. Um, we commit to ensuring that we are observing worker rights, or we are um, 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 not using um, 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 inappropriate ways to produce things and so forth. That sends a signal not just to the European Union, but to the whole world that we have a regulatory system mm. that allows us to produce things that can go anywhere. Mm. So that's also part of what I think we get. Mm. And then there's the cooperation that comes from it, whereby we work with the European Union to improve all of these areas over that time. Mm. So I think it's a sweetheart deal. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't compare it to... to, to to uh, <clears throat> the status before. To the status before. <laughs> And it's certainly something that we look forward to implementing. Alfred Kambudo is the Principal Secretary for Trade in the Ministry of MITI. We're asking ourselves, which comes first, investment or industry? The Ministry of? Uh, it's investment, trade and industry. Okay. <laughs> uh, but as a trade person, mm. you know, um, we always say that uh, most investors in this world start off as traders. Mm. So for you, it should be MTII. Yeah. It's meaty. Uh. <laughs> um, so, Piers, what will we see? You know, this, you know, marriage made in heaven, they'll say you see fruits. Mm -hmm. Grandma will come knocking on your door in nine months. What are the fruits of this marriage? What will, how pressure. will we see? Pressure. <laughs> so there's pressure, isn't it? Correct. How, what are we going to see manifested mm -hmm. as a result of this sweetheart deal, as you call mm -hmm. it, uh, that will say, okay, yeah, for real, something is happening here. We should feel something, isn't it? Yes. What will we see? <clears throat> I'll give you a few examples. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think um, this agreement is quite good for trade and investment and industry. Uh, number one, <clears throat> we have about... Uh, uh we we <coughs> we we <coughs> slaughter about uh, 2 to 2.5 to 3 million uh livestock every year <coughs> uh we have a situation whereby much of these hides and skins <coughs> are going to waste mm. we have a budding leather industry uh, there are companies that have uh, come up in this sector now, if you look at Europe, Italy and Germany are one of the biggest consumers of finished leather products and articles of leather <coughs> uh, for industrial purposes, but also for bags, straps of watches, upholstery as part of furniture, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this agreement signals that anybody who invests <coughs> into making articles of leather has a market in Europe that basically affords them more or less free entry into that market. <clears throat> we can expect the leather sector to grow because of this. Already we have companies that are certified to supply to companies like Zara. Mm. If you look at Alfarama and if you look at all these other companies, that is happening. We also have German investors. I think there's one in Quale that is basically already making shoes using hides and skins from here and taking them to Germany. So you do expect sectors like that to grow, and as we become more familiar with the buyer tastes on the other side, that could happen. <clears throat> Secondly, is agro-processing. We uh, do take a lot of agricultural products uh, into the EU, a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, it is time for us now to start processing these into juices, other preparations, and so on and so forth. Now that an investor would know that our access into this market is permanent <clears throat> until the last sun rises, mm. uh, then they will be able to go into banks to look for more money. <clears throat> if I go to a bank and tell them that I need a 15-year plan, mm. it has to be backed by revenues that you can foresee for 15 or 30 years. And then that is also the second thing that's going to happen. <clears throat> Another thing that's going to happen 
is that um, we are going to see a lot more development cooperation between us and the European Union. You know, um, <clears throat> nowadays the political imperative is look after your friends, look after your closer friends even better. So we have signaled that we are prepared for a long-term relationship and we also expect that the development cooperation which already the EU is one of the largest, should actually increase even further. They have a medium term coming up of the program with Kenya, and already they have said, let's deepen this further, let's increase our development cooperation in trade, and so on and so forth. Mm. So that's somehow what I see coming through. But most importantly, is that farmer <clears throat> that does snow peas in Kieni mm. on a quarter acre plot, now knows that probably they have a chance of exporting this over a long time. Mm. The person that's developing deep sea fishing uh, in Lamu, where we have Barracuda, we have all that, has a chance of investing more. Our people in the flower sector who put up a very beautiful flower wall in State House on Monday um, <clears throat> as a thank you, basically now know that they continue having this market. Mm. Apart from the uh, duty free in terms of customs duty, is there are there any other taxes that uh, companies that set up here mm -hmm. that um, sell into these European markets will enjoy? Well, um, we apart from just the access to market that is now the customs. Yes. And that is actually, um, that's why MITI is MITI, mm -hmm. because it's not just about trade. It's about investment, it's about industry. Yeah. So at MITI, we do roll out um, <coughs> programs that are supposed to encourage investment and also industry. Mm -hmm. So people could easily, for example, base in special economic zones mm -hmm. if they want to re-export. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they would benefit also <coughs> from... Uh, 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 a lot of um, reductions in terms of um, when they need to start, uh, for example, paying uh, corporate taxes, mm -hmm. there's a lag on that, mm -hmm. and several other such sweeteners. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and therefore, somebody coming in here will get a market, but if they're in a special economic zone, they'll be able to get uh, um, 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 considerations in, far, uh, in as far as uh, a lead period for their taxation, yeah. <clears throat> they will be able to benefit from so-called horizontal infrastructure whereby we are putting together uh, special economic zones whereby the roads are going to be built mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> they will also benefit from geothermal energy and we never say this enough because we are a country that's already 92-93% uh, renewable energy and a company that comes here doesn't just get um, market access into places like the European Union, but they can also manufacture using geothermal energy, which is green, which is valued, and which will put a premium on the cost on the of product the product that they sell. Correct. So there are several advantages. Concern has been raised <coughs> that this basically just gives access to existing European companies or investors mm -hmm. to come into this country, get labor, mm -hmm leave us with nothing and take a lot of uh, with little mm -hmm. but take a lot of the benefits to the european countries so for example a company that is registered and based in italy mm -hmm. that is dealing with leather products mm -hmm. comes and sets up at the special economic zone in Naivasha mm -hmm. that supports them to mm -hmm. manufacture those same leather watch straps mm -hmm. and shoes and belts and bags at Naivasha using kenyan labor which is more affordable compared to what they would get there, then they're not paying corporate tax in Kenya. Mm -hmm. They are getting access into Italy, duty-free into Italy. They brought in their manufacturing equipment into the country, paid zero duty. So basically they have manufactured here, they've used our energy, paid a little bit uh, of money into the energy, which has also been subsidized because you know they're in a special economic zone, and they have taken the money back to Italy. Is that a legitimate concern? Mm, well, it doesn't sound quite so mm -hmm. because let's break it down even further because you've been fairly detailed in your um, hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if this guy comes in from Italy 
he is uh, probably going to uh, come with some machinery that can make uh, maybe nice buttons or nice stitches or whatever and <clears throat> they will need to get the labor that you are describing yeah uh, they will have to train these people on how to make those kind of stitches and cuts and trims and so on and so forth. Yeah. So they're already imparting skill. Mm -hmm. This will be a business that um, is probably going to occupy 30, 40,000 square feet, maybe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> What's exactly going to happen? They're going to be paying rent or they're going to build something. So that's going to be a bit good for the construction sector. But most importantly, they'll be hiring ten or 20,000 people. Mm. These ten or 20,000 people will have a livelihood. They will take their kids to school. And uh, they will also be paying um, 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 <coughs> pay as yuan, mm. which will also give uh, government a little bit of revenue for development projects. But they will have transporters transporting their stuff. If it's a leather thing, they will be buying uh, hides and skins they'll be buying chemicals they'll be buying industrial salts they'll be um, having cooperatives all over the country aggregating in sheds and bandas uh, to bring in their hides and skins they will actually be creating several industries which we are going to be benefiting from so by the time this person is taking their things to be exported back to italy we are also going to be enjoying more foreign exchange so that then we are able to balance <coughs> on our exports and our imports mm -hmm. now sacrificing a little bit of corporate uh, tax in exchange for what we get on pay as you earn in exchange for jobs in exchange for supplies in exchange for that person who wakes up to transport, in exchange for that harder that is able to basically get maybe six or seven thousand shillings more from their hides and skins, mm -hmm. that replication is extremely important. And in fact, many countries that have grown have used the same model. Mm -hmm. Dubai, which is now one of the leading global forces in services, basically created an incentive structure for people to go into that country and stay in that country. I think that's where Kenya needs to go. Would there be an opportunity then for <clears throat> these people who have acquired this technical skill and knowledge, mm -hmm. having worked for this Italian conglomerate in Naivasha, mm -hmm. to set up their own and still have access competitively in Italy? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In fact, um, over time, that's how capabilities develop. Um, these people will also be able to have a niche market that the big conglomerate will not have. They may be able to set up a smaller industry where maybe things are being done by hand, mm. where there's a story to tell about um, where the thing is being made. They can tell a story about their culture or make artifacts that reflect their culture. And then they can sell this at an even higher premium. And one of the things then that we are committed to do in this agreement is in the trade facilitation side and the custom side for even small businesses to be able to export more easily mm. and without all of these uh, strictures. So dynamically, the person who starts off as somebody who's teaching in an con Italian conglomerate may end up being somebody who can make 10 bags a month of their own. The stitching may not be exactly the same, mm. but the story would be priceless. Okay. And many European consumers, they do not just buy goods, they buy the story. The expectation then, finally, mm. would be that among the strategies that MITI is developing would be to ensure that we have Kenyan startups mm -hmm. that are able to set up and access this market. I'm giving the example of the agoa structures that we've had yes and the textile manufacturing that happens in this uh, epz's mm -hmm. how many kenyan companies have established originally kenyan mm -hmm. that are taking advantage of agoa not companies from elsewhere that have set up epz in uh, set up at epz to access the american market has there been a deliberate strategy that says since the beginning of agoa we've actually increased the number of kenyan companies that are in the apparel sector that are then selling directly or accessing the american market would there be a same kind of conversation with this particular one for the eu a very important question and i'm glad you asked that 
um, already we are having lots of support to track what small businesses are being able to take into Europe and to support them. And I'll share with you just two examples <coughs> of uh, support which the European Union is providing also because of this agreement. There is the Business Environment <coughs> and Export Promotion Program called BEEP, which <coughs> is more than about 25 mil million euros mm. over a few years, mm. that basically is working with local small entrepreneurs to help them understand what the EU market wants, to connect them to buyers, to help them understand the rules of importation and the quality standards required, to help them with um, all those issues that they need to do in order to export into that market. I mean, how uh, generous would somebody be to get into a trade agreement with you and immediately put money to help you get goods into their market. I think that's the quite question something. is yes. what does our government do to make sure that we take we maximize these opportunities? We are investing not just in ensuring that our trade <coughs> regulations and our export procedures are up to scratch, but we are also putting up the infrastructure for that. I'll share with you an example. The Kenya Ports Authority has now what they are calling a green channel. Yeah. We know that we need to get goods to markets as cheaply as possible and as ambient as possible. Air travel nowadays uh, emits a lot of carbon and our network, of course, could, could improve. So what are we doing? We are using the sea to basically start taking products that previously could only go by air. Mm -hmm. And uh, using this, we are now, for example, taking flowers to Amsterdam by ship that arrives after about three or four days, you just make sure that there's nitrogen inside and that the flower ripe uh, blooms very slowly when it's in there mm. and it gets there uh, when it's ready. Mm. So we are also as a government taking all of these measures in infrastructure, in the rules and procedures to make sure that we are able to access these markets as well. Then we are working with the development partners to then understand those markets and support our entrepreneurs to get into those markets. Is Kenya as a market generally when we're looking at, because a lot of this I would assume, also based on what you've said, is product based. There are things that are being manufactured here, there are things that are being grown. Would you say that in its entirety, or is there work that needs to be done, is Kenya prepared then to deliver because there's demand. Mm -hmm. There's demand on the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So here, which unfortunately sometimes when we look at some of these agreements, then we find that not enough preparation has been done on this side for the mm. demand that's required yeah. on the other side. Yeah. Is Kenya primed at this point? Or, and if not, what work needs to be done and what timelines are we looking at to deliver? Excellent. Um, Kenya is primed, I believe. Mm. Lots of work needs to be done um, in order to uh, get a bigger slice of the pie. You know, the two things that count is what's the size of the pie and what's my slice of that pie. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you negotiate a trade agreement, you're trying to cook a bigger pie, right? Mm -hmm. Your export strategy is what the slice of that pie you're able to get after baking it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done we need to, for example, ensure that our exporters have cheaper sources of finance, mm. for trade finance. We need to ensure that they are able to negotiate commercial agreements out there in a way that doesn't disadvantage them and so on and so forth. But are we ready? Yes. And not just us, but this agreement basically can also benefit the rest of the region. So do we have enough supplies? If we don't have enough supplies, we can basically import from other East African community country raw materials that we can also take to, to, to these places after adding value and so on and so forth. Mm. Lots of work needs to be done. Any developing country needs to do that. But I think that we have started putting together the building blocks for that. Today. You know, let me tell you where my mind has gone to. Mm. If what when a PS is telling us works exactly as he has said it, then one could argue that Kenya is heading towards what is referred to an economic takeoff stage. Mm -hmm. Now, we 
tend to use the word in this in, in Kenya to describe such things, benchmarking. Mm. Which country are we benchmarking with? Which country has followed this path that we have followed, we are now following, mm. and has actually arrived at that point where they've taken off? <coughs> very, very important question. Costa Rica, mm. about 30 years ago, mm. got on the basis of uh, a trade agreement uh, with the United uh, States, uh, Intel uh, and Windows, the so-called Wintel combination, mm. uh, they started making microchips in Costa Rica because of this agreement. Over time, Costa Rica then developed science courses, engineers, people who understand semiconductors and so on and so forth with the result that Costa Rica then broadly managed to get into manufacturing as a country. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, also invested a lot on environmental sustainability such that one of the two things you know about Costa Rica is how it developed manufacturing and environmental sustainability and that arose from a trade agreement mm. and it arose from doing something like this. I'll give you another example. <coughs> um, Dubai, which is part of the United Arab Emirates. They looked at the ability for them to access different markets but then be able to do value addition there as a basis for that and to create jobs around there. We want to ensure that we work along that line of value addition just like they have done. And we do not just want to get raw materials from Kenya, we want to get raw materials from East Africa, we want to get raw materials from all over the world, so that then value addition happens here. That's another place whereby I think I can benchmark on. But when I speak of Dubai, something comes to mind, which I think it's important for Kenyans to know. Mm. Um, one of the areas that we are going to negotiate further with the EU is on trade in services. Mm. And that way, we'll be able to also not just take goods, but we'll have our services people do jobs there and so on and so forth. And that will be good for us. Hey. Okay. You paint a good picture, man. Mm -hmm. Full senior. He will come back. He will. Mm -hmm. Alfred Kombudo, Principal Secretary, State Department for Trade, has been our guest. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.